So I think the time is uh, 11.15. So and um, uh, we have to get started. And uh, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, uh, Richard Campbell. And uh, Richard came as a postdoc to learn. And we did some very nice work together and he was we also started to do some neutron experiment to, together and uh, Richard then get uh, was assigned to be the instrument uh, scientist in uh, at Figaro and um, I don't know how many neutron experiments you had done before <laughs> but uh, not so many and uh, he, he made a fantastic job in uh, developing the figure instrument. So, so the lesson is, don't be afraid to start to, uh, using neutron and neutron scattering. Don't be afraid of uh, some complex uh, formulas and so on. You will master it and no worries at all. So, and since then, uh, Richard and I worked together and we had met and we had beer together and so on. So, so I always uh, appreciate Richard's careful analysis of problems and uh, careful in writing a paper. Writing a paper with Richard, you know, if you don't um, get um, uh, above the version 20, I think it's a failure. <laughs> <laughs> so please, Richard. Okay, well, thanks for the introduction, Tommy. And like you mentioned, uh, I came to Lund back in 2006 and had a very enjoyable two years in Lund. Um, and I remember in the first week I was presented with a broken ellipsometer to reconstruct, which scared, scared me a lot, but somehow I got through that. And then two years later, I went to ILL to take what was bits of a neutron reflectometer and put them together as well, uh, which was an even bigger challenge. But even though they were both quite scary at the time, uh, I think it all came good. Um, so, yeah, when I was with Tommy, uh, I did some neutron experiments, but also ellipsometry and Bruce Strangle microscopy, and these will be themes throughout today. And like Tommy said, I went on to ILL to commission and to be responsible for the Figaro liquids reflectometer. So um, I'm going to give you an introduction to that instrument. Um, not only neutron reflector reflectivity as a technique, but different ways to use it and how actually you could submit the same beam time proposal and propose to do different types of measurements and, and learn different types of things. So that's what I hope to do today. But like the title suggests, the, this is about um, using the air liquid interface as a platform to study drug interactions. And there's, I'm going to present three different projects looking at different drug interactions. Um, and when we come to those pro projects, they were done in collaboration with Daniela Chiumach and Gian Lu at the University of Manchester, and I was at the ILL at the time. Then also Marite Cardenas, who at the time was at the University of Copenhagen and now is in Malmö, and I think on her way to Singapore for a sabbatical. Um, and then the third project was with Dorota Matijuska and Renata Bilovic at Warsaw University. So those are the three kind of uh, research projects I'll present later. But to start, I'm going to give you an introduction to the neutron technique, but this won't be a standard introduction, as I say, it will be more of a um, uh, trying, to, trying to get different things out of the same technique. So the, the slides will uh, start with uh, Figaro as a cutting edge neutron reflectometer applied in the biosciences, then looking at these three different ways to exploit the same technique. And the three projects will be structural disruption by antimicrobial peptides, membrane binding of liquid crystalline nanocarriers and interactions of anti-cancer drugs. So let's start by looking at the Figaro reflectometer. So it was commissioned back in 2008 and it's a time of flight neutron reflectometer. It's on a, it's on a reactor neutron source. So it's a continuous white stream of neutrons that come along guides. So highly reflective mirrors that come along guides to the, to the instrument. So, so in the top right schematic, the neutrons come from the right side and probably the most important aspect of a neutron reflectometer is the choppers or the spinning disks. So you see some disk-like um, feature after that. And these are 
discs that absorb neutrons, but they have a hole in, and they spin around and essentially they can create pulses. And the special thing about Figaro is that while normally there would be two choppers to form a neutron pulse, in this case, there are four. So at any time, two choppers will control the pulse. And if they're the two choppers that are closest together, you form small but very well-defined packets of neutrons, which has lower flux, but gives you high resolution in the data. Or if you use two choppers that are far further apart, you have these big, big pulses, but the, but the starting timing and position of each neutron is much less well-defined. So the resolution in the data is less, but you have more flux. So after that, there's some mirrors which can deflect the neutrons down to the sample, then a sample area, and then they bounce up to the detector. So the principle of the time of flight is that these neutron pulses will travel down the instrument, reflect off the sample and up to the detector. But the time they take to do that depends on their energy or their wavelength. So in, in Figaro, they have neutrons from two to 30 angstroms. And the two, two, the two angstrom neutrons have a low wavelength. So they're, they're frequency and energy are high, so they travel fast. And then the 30 angstrom neutrons have a high wavelength. So their frequency is low and their energy is low, so they travel slow. So essentially, once that pulse is made, it travels down the instrument. Because, it's, because, it, because they all take different times, the, the high energy neutrons arrive first and the, the low energy neutrons arrive last. So all the detector needs to do, it gets the easy job, it just needs to record in time and then you can plot instead of against time, you can plot the wavelength. So that's the principle of the time of flight technique. And uh, the features of the instrument is that it's a powerful and, and versatile instrument, meaning that you have this choice of chopper pairs. So you can balance the between having high resolution or high flux. And actually those mirrors which direct the neutrons of the sample, you can imagine with an air liquid interface, the neutrons travel better through air than the liquid. So you would always reflect up at an air-liquid air interface. So the neutrons will go down and bounce up off the sample. But there are actually some, some examples where it's actually better to reflect downwards. So uh, on Figaro, they've done recently a lot of oil water experiments with bulk oil and bulk water. And then when the oil floats above the water, it can be actually easy, easier for the neutrons to go through the water in, than the oil. So in, in that case, it's better to reflect down. So it's quite versatile and flexible. Um, but it's also important to get into perspective the, the, the nature of the instrument. So the beam size is several tens of centimeters. It's not very, not, not got good spatial resolution. It's not like a, a, a laser or, or an AFM with like looking at the nanometers scale. This is looking at tens of centimeters. And the data required are required in, in a time scale between seconds and minutes. So there's a huge range of science that can be done from peptide bindings, DNA interactions, reaction kinetics, drug nanocarriers, interfacial mechanisms, formulations, biophysics, and various other types of science. So it's about designing the experiment that can answer specific questions using the, the neutrons. So the, the neutron instrument was built, um, but even though the, the infrastructure of the instrument is important, you can't do much without really state-of-the-art sample, sample environment. So on the top left there, you can see adsorption troughs, which are really quite, quite attractively made. And you have these quite large uh, Teflon or BTFE troughs in which you pour in your solutions. So you have quite a large air liquid interface where the neutrons can bounce off. And on the upper right, upper left side of that assembly, you can see this perspex and these, there's mirrors where a laser will go through to precisely align the height of the sample. And that's important because it, because the, the neutron reflectivity is a grazing angle technique. The angle of the neutrons can be even less than a degree. So it's really important to get the height right. So in real time, the, the laser could, the, the, the instrument control can speak to the laser and then, and then the whole assembly can move up or down so that the neutrons are at the right position. Um, top right is a Langmuir trough and we're gonna look at some examples later of, of of drug interaction solved using a Langmuir trough as a platform to look at the air-water interface. And there, the most obvious thing is to spread a lipid monolayer. So you spread lipid and insoluble, quite insoluble molecules using a, an organic carrier solvent, and they, they form a monolayer. And then you can use barriers to control the surface pressure. At the bottom left, you have a suite of solid liquid interface cells. So this is a silicon crystal pressed against some, some liquid, 
and that then they're kind of squeezed together. And the neutrons go actually really well through some solids. So the so there you can use sapphire or silicon, and the neutrons just travel through the sapphire or silicon and reflect off the water. And these are used a lot in terms of binding of molecules to, to different model biomembranes. And the, the last one is a rather specialized environment, but it was this uh, overflowing cylinder where uh, water comes from a gravity feed and just goes up a cylinder and spills over it. But it's designed to create a flow. So you can actually reflect neutrons of a flowing liquid surface and look at uh, formulations relative uh, of relevance to how they're actually used, which is not waiting for them to equilibrate, but actually under dynamic conditions. Okay, so the next three slides are going to consider three aspects of using neutron reflectometry to, to address problems that might be of relevance to your research projects. And the first one is like the standard way of using the technique, but I'll go on to show you two other ways that can be quite interesting to bear in mind. So the first is to use neutron reflectometry to look at the interfacial structure. So here you have a relatively collimated fine beam of neutrons reflecting off the sample at grazing angles at a low angle. And the nice thing here is their sensitivity to light elements. So if you were to compare with X-ray reflectivity, uh, the number of electrons in, in, the, in the atom increases with the atomic number. So X-ray reflectivity is more sensitive to heavy atoms. So actually, if you think of the, the lightest atom, hydrogen, there's really not much sensitivity at all. The nice thing about neutrons is that it depends on the, 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 the coherent neutron scattering length. So if you look at the top, the, like the, the center image there, what, what you can see there is some different uh, isotopes. So there's, there's one, one H and two H as the first two, so that's hydrogen and deuterium. And then there's carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. But you can see that their, their values, they're not that predictable according to the atomic number. Their, their scattering lengths depend um, very specifically on the isotope in question. But the peculiarity is that the neutron scattering length of hydrogen and deuterium have opposite signs. So they really stand out relative to each other. So it, actually, if you think of organic molecules with a lot of CH2 uh, groups, like repeating CH2 along a, like a hydrocarbon chain, if you add one carbon and two hydrogens together there, so 6.65 minus two times 3.74, you have a very low number. So what that means is that hydrocarbons themselves are quite invisible to neutrons. But all of a sudden, if you deuterate that molecule and you have CD2 instead of CH2, that number goes up massively. So it means that you can take individual components in a mixture, and if you deuterate them, they really stand out. The other special thing about neutron reflectivity is the, the wavelength. So I've already alluded to the fact that the wavelengths around the angstrom layer. But if you think of the self-assembly of, of uh, soft matter systems like lipid monolayers, they're, they're, the thickness of these layers are, are on the angstrom scale too. So if you take a surfactant like SDS, it will form a monolayer of about one nanometer. If you take a lipid like DPPC, maybe it's closer to two nanometers. But these are around the wavelengths that we're looking at. And what that means is that if we have a monolayer, so look at the, the bottom left schematic here, and we have this neutron wave reflecting off the top interface, and then also it going to refract through the monolayer and reflect back off, off the subphase, of, uh, so reflecting off the second interface, those two waves are going to interfere. And you'll have regions of, in, of constructive and destructive interference. So as opposed to if you use light to do that, you know, the light has a, a wavelength of hundreds of nanometers. So it hasn't got the, the sensitivity to make interference patterns for such thin films. But neutrons do. So if you look at the bottom center schematic there, this is, these are neutron reflectivity profiles where on the left, there's the log of the reflectivity. <clears throat> and the bottom axis is called Q, the momentum transfer, which is related to the sign of the angle over the wavelength. Um, so that's just the way that we normally uh, plot our neutron data. But you can see there, this is a simulation for films of different thicknesses. You can see in the legend there, you have films ranging from 15 angstroms up to 50 angstroms. And there, there's an interference fringe that actually is going for, going from right to left as the film gets thicker. So what that means is that if we do a neutron reflectivity measurement, then it, the position of the fringe is gonna tell us the, the thickness of the layer. But more to the point, 
it'll, it'll tell us mostly where the thickness of the deuterated molecules. So if you were to measure in different isotopic contrasts, like a normal molecule than a deuterated molecule, then that fringe position would change. And you could model the data together to reveal the interfacial structure. So on the right here is, uh, is the result of a neutron experiment. And it's of a, a student that Tommy supervised called Mari Mariana Yanez Ateta, and I co-supervised co her. And these are some data of when a, a dendromus or a hyperbranch polyelectrolyte interacts with a surfactant. So at the top, you see some schematics of different possible interfacial structures formed. And at the bottom, there's some data. So those four data sets are having dendroma with either normal or deuterated surfactant and either a mixture of H2O and D2O that, that has zero scattering called contrast match water or D2O. So essentially there's four contrasts. So H and D, SDS and H and D water practically. So there's the four contrasts there. And you can see that, that, that for, the, for the, the red and the green data, and I apologize if anyone is colorblind, but for two of the data sets there, there's a sharp interference fringe like is shown in the middle picture. So what that does is if you, can if you apply a common model to that, if you to simulate your data and optimize the model for, for the number of molecules and where they're sitting, you can actually work out where the molecules are and all the different components. Whereas some other lab techniques, they can give you an overall amount of material, but they can't tell you where different, different species are. And what you get out of that is a volume fraction profile, which is shown at the top right uh, of, that, of that image. And in the red is the amount of surfactant, in the black is the amount of dendro. So that's the type of the type of information you get from the experiment. And then here's another example from the literature of an antibody binding to a to a peg layer on a on a on a grafting layer on a silicon surface. And they just the, the data aren't shown here, but what's shown is the result and really the, the level of detail you can get out of these nutrient experiments. So again, in doing measurements in different isotopic contrasts, you get the volume fractions of all these different components. There's the silicon, there's a silicon dioxide layer, grafting layer, you've got your peg brush, your antibody and the water. And that's what you get out. You get all that information about the amounts of material, where they are, their volume fraction, their thickness. Okay, so that's the normal application of neutron reflectometry. And here we go on to the, the second one. So this is, uh, a technique that emerged over the last five years. So it's still quite fresh, but it's now really being used a lot. So um, let's look at the top left. And this is a simulation of a single layer um, in air contrast match water. So the air contrast match water has a scattering length of zero, has a scattering length density of zero. So on that top left figure, if you look at the inset, there's a scattering length density graph against the distance down to the interface. So I've added just a little bit of smoothing to the data just to, just to have some, a realistic roughness of the interface. But essentially, one of the curves, the blue curves, is rather sharp and thin. And the, the green curve, the other curve, is rather broad and, and less, in, less intense. So essentially, what I've done there is I've simulated two different layers. One is dense but thin, and the other is not dense and thicker. But there's the same amount of molecules in each layer. So I've, I've, I've there simulated two different systems with the same amount of molecules, but for different densities. Now, what you can see from the neutron reflectivity figure on the left is that at the low Q, these data co coincide. So, um, so when I've simulated two, two systems with the same number of molecules, their reflectivity at the low Q is the same. But actually over the whole Q range, if you go further to the right, then the data are different. So that's why in, when you're interested in measuring the interfacial structure, you need to measure over the full Q range you can get because it's the data at the high Q that has the highest sensitivity to the thickness. But what I'm saying here is if you just measure at the low Q, then you don't have sensitivity to the thickness. So whilst that would normally be considered a limitation in this new implementation of the technique, it, it acts as a strength. So the idea now is to say, actually, if we measure only at low Q, we don't need to worry about the structure. We don't need to worry about where the molecules are, but we can just measure their amounts. So the data at the top right is measuring a polymer and a surfactant in different isotopic contrasts. If you 
if you look at the, the three data sets over the full Q range, they would take about two hours to, to, result, to measure normally, about 40 minutes a data set on average. And you would get out that the, the scattering density profile in the inset. So you'd get to know the amounts of the material and where they are in two hours. But if you look at the data in the green circle, I can measure the, that, the, the upper one in red in about a second or two. And if I make the, the polymer, com uh, sorry, the surfactant completely invisible by, by isotopic substitution and just look at the amount of polymer, then, then uh, just above the background there, you have the, this tiny signal from the polymer, which I can measure in a minute or two. So what that means is if I just measure at low Q and I measure a sample in two different isotopic contrasts, but both in air contrast matched water, then in, in one or two minutes, I can resolve the amounts of the two components. And that's what the equations in, in the middle say there. So the scattering and density times the thickness is the, essentially it's the, the, the absorbed amount, it's the product of, of the, the number of molecules in the system. So, so for a single component, the scattering and density times the thickness is equal to the absorbed amount times the scattering length of that component times Avogadro's number. If you have two components, you can solve those simultaneous equations. You make your two measurements a low Q and the, the reflectivity can be solved to get your surface excess of, of each component. So what we're saying here is that, that before, to get the surface excess of each component, we would measure for two hours and we would get the structure as well. But now we can measure for two minutes and we, and we only get the composition, but this can really open up lots of studies into dynamics and, and kinetics that was not possible before. Um, yeah, and the data at the bottom left is, is, is some data that was uh, recorded first back in 2016. And in this case, we had a polymer surfactant mixture, which we, we compressed and expanded on a Langmuir off five times. We wanted to measure the amounts of polymer and surfactant during the compression. So before this wouldn't have been possible because the measurements would have taken too long. But, but now, it, because I can resolve measurements in two minutes, I can, I can measure the amount of each component during dy dy dynamic uh, experiments. <clears throat> and last, <coughs> the last uh, application of neutron reflectometry I'm going to call particle attachment. And this is related to the diffraction of neutrons through multilayered samples. So if you have a multi-layer sample and you have an instant beam, then the reflection at each interface is going to give a, a reflection and all the waves will interfere. And what you get in that case is a, a Bragg diffraction peak. So in the bottom left, you can see some data of a polymer surfactant mixture at the air water interface, which formed this 2D hexagonal phase. So here we had an ordered phase at the air water interface and this Bragg diffraction peak would tell us the, the amount of the, the ordered material at the interface. And then here's some, some more uh, data from Tommy's group and uh, one of his PhD students back in 2008, Pauline van der Legge, and she was looking at uh, liquid crystalline nanoparticles and in particular she was looking at cubosomes. And there she did some, some novel neutron experiments looking at the, the, this Bragg peak with time and the Bragg peak was the signal that actually the cubosome had attached to the surface. So <clears throat> neutron reflectivity, most people think of it as one technique, but I've made the point here that actually we can think of it as three. We can design experiments. So we measure multiple contrasts over the full Q range to get the structure, or we can do kinetic or dynamic experiments focusing on the low Q range to get the interfacial composition, or we can even look at the uh, particle attaching. So it's almost like three techniques in one. So with that introduction to how we're going to use and exploit the technique to understand drug interactions, let's move on to three different examples. So this first example, as I mentioned, was done in collaboration with Daniela Chiumach and Jian Lu at the University of Manchester when I was still at the ILL, which started then anyway. And the motivation for the research was that um, we know that antibiotics function by various mechanisms. For example, penicillins work with interference with cell wall synthesis, and there are other mechanisms like interference with nucleic acid synthesis. But there's been a discovery void. So uh, the major antibiotic discoveries um, were from the 1920s through to the 1980s. 
And therefore, because of antimicrobial resistance, there's a strong motivation to discover new types of antimicrobial materials. This um, particular project um, was done uh, to look at some short designed uh, peptide, uh, antimicrobial peptides. And these have normally at least two positively charged residues and they're usually more than 50% hydrophobic. So they can have any kind of uh, structure according to the sequence of uh, amino acids used. So um, this was done uh, in collaboration with uh, Manchester Petroleum University of China and the ILL. And it was looking at these short design peptides with the sequence G, I, I, K, repeating N, I, and NH2. And the N number really gave different results of the efficacy and of the interfacial behavior. So if you look at the top right, this is the survival rate of different bacteria. There's E. coli or beta subtilis. And it was showing that uh, for one of these peptides, you could, you could uh, get effective uh, suppression of the survival rate with just a few micromolar of the peptide concentration. And at the same time, that's all very well, but if these are so deadly that, that uh, it destroys all the red blood cells, then that's not very good. So the hemolytic activity is shown in the bottom right, where below about eight micrometers, there, there was negligible hemolysis for four of the different peptides. So essentially, that was just saying that these have quite some promise to, to have anti, anti microbial activity, but not be too harmful. So that was the basis on which to start the project. Now, the reason to do a, a surface project is to gain insight into the mechanism of interaction of peptides. There's still debate over the way in which different peptides interact with biomembranes. For example, toroidal pores can form or a carpeting mechanism in which, which disrupts the membrane. So any information we can get from the application of reflectometry or surface sensitive techniques can, can give some uh, insight into this approach. So um, the, the group in, the, I mean, quite a few years ago, the group looked at the minimum inhibitory concentration to, the, 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 for the efficacy of the peptides. And it was shown that for the different N numbers, the N equals four peptide, which was abbreviated to G4, had a uh, very low minimum inhibitory concentration. So two micromolar for uh, E. coli and 0.5 micromolar for beta subtilis. So, uh, so then this essentially prompted a, led to a PhD project uh, of Daniela, who then took that G4 peptide and, and studied the surface behavior. So um, when designing a, a model membrane system, it's important to, to uh, Essentially, according to the type of membrane you want to study, you can form a combination of lipids to mimic certain um, membranes. But uh, one feature of the neutrons is it's often useful to um, start it with simple single lipid systems before you can build up to more complex systems. And this is some, this is you could say it's a limitation of the technique that a lot of the studies of neutrons are done with uh, very simple model systems. But I think, as you'll see here, I hope, this is a good example of uh, starting with model systems, getting that f basic understanding of, of the molecular parameters and then building up to more realistic model, system, model systems. So this slide was simply comparing DPPC with DPPG. So it's a zwitterionic uh, saturated lipid with an anionic saturated lipid. So very basic model systems. But this is first like looking at the different lipid characteristics. And in this case, uh, a lipid monolayer was spread on a Langmuir trough, and then peptide was injected underneath the subplates. Starting surface pressure was 15 millinewtons per meter. And here it can be seen that with the anionic lipid, the DPPG monolayer, it seems that the surface pressure is rising more. And therefore you would infer that the extent of interaction of the peptide with the lipid monolayer is higher. However, Surface pressure is not a, a quantitative direct technique to, to work out the number of molecules absorbed. For example, when a, when a peptide is to penetrate the chains layer, the surface pressure would probably go up much higher than if it were to sit underneath and bind to the head groups, because, because then the pressure of the chains would, would increase if it's, if it's penetrating that layer. 
So just because the interaction of the DPPC is lower, we can't we can't confirm from these data alone that the interaction is less. It might just be different. And that's why, of course, it's good to, it's good to apply different techniques. So at the top left, there's some Brewster angle microscopy images. So this is a, an optical technique where uh, essentially p-polarized light uh, at 53 degrees for the air water interface. Normally it transmits fully uh, and uh, with some approximations. And then when you have a lipid monolayer, if there are domains of lipids that are in the condensed phase, they, they really should stand out as being very uh, bold and, and white in the images. So for DPPG monolayers alone, you can see this phase behavior because there's these lateral domains of lipids in the condensed phase. But when you inject the peptide underneath, you can see that membrane disruption where the phase of the lipid over 25 minutes is completely disrupted. Then if you look at the top right figure, we have some low Q data of the kinetics. And here we're in the air contrast match water and we have an, we've made a contrast match DPPG monolayer. So the lipid's invisible. So all we're seeing here is, is the peptide. And the first run is the lighter run at the bottom and the last run is the, the, the darkest run at the top. And what that shows is that in real time on the minute time scale, we can measure the penetration of the G4 peptide into the monolayer. Then at the bottom left, uh, we have the traditional structural uh, analysis. So this is the data that I showed, that, that, like, like the type of data I showed in the first example. And here we can resolve the, the thickness and volume fraction of the ACR chains layer, then the head group, and then principally in this case, uh, at the low pressure the peptide was sitting underneath. So, um, uh, in, in, in summary, the the interaction with the DPPG um, was shown to be much higher. And, um, and this led us then to go on to look at different parameters of the lipid. Oh, I should just say at the top right here that the using the low Q analysis, the second implementation of neutral, neutral reflectivity, then the, the interaction of the, the peptide was quantified for both the DPPC and the DPPG. And also that the, the lipid was lost from the monolayer which is something that's often, when you do Langmuir isotherms, it's often, um, often uh, researchers would assume that lipid is not lost from the monolayer when, when something from the subphase interacts with the lipid, because the, you keep this, this axis, you, you assume full lipid insolubility and that it stays there. But this is showing that in interacting the peptide with the lipid monolayer, you actually lost lipid. And that was also according to the charge of the lipid as well. So the second study was to go on to look at the effects of starting surface pressure and of the, the saturation of the lipid. And um, from the surface pressure alone, um, the, the effect of the, the saturation um, was rather minimal. So DPPG, which is what we looked at before, was, is the saturated anionic lipid and POPG is an unsaturated anionic lipid. So the head group's the same for comparison. What you can do here is start at different surface pressures and look at how much the, the surface pressure goes up. So you can plot the change in surface pressure against the starting surface pressure. And if you make a graph of that and extrapolate down to, 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 to the zero change in surface pressure, that would be the, the, the maximum insertion pressure. And you can see for both lipids that it's approximately the same at 43 millimeters per meter. So from surface pressure alone, you would, you would conclude that the interactions are quite similar. But it's not what was concluded from the neutrons, which again shows the, the benefit of applying more than one technique. So the same type of data here in the top left, we have the, the DPPG in the, in the left panel and the POPG in the right panel. And, and essentially the, that fringe in the data on the left panel shows that, that you form quite a thick layer with the peptide and the extent of penetration is much higher. And then we have the low Q kinetic analysis in the top right, again, showing that at the higher, uh, in this case, showing um, at the higher pressure. So those are the black diamond in the left panel. You've got a higher penetration of peptide when the, the, the surface pressure, starting surface pressure is higher. So that's interesting given that those are around 30 millimeter per meter is closer to the so, uh, pressures found in, in real cell membranes. And here you get a higher penetration of the peptide. 
And again, the schematic there shows that at the higher pressure and with the uh, with the saturated lipid, there was a higher pressure, a higher higher penetration of peptide, not only into the chains but also the head groups. Then, lastly, just one slide on a study that came out uh, earlier this year, um, and that was starting now to mix the lipids. So, although previously the two studies had looked at the effect of the lipid charge starting surface pressure and effects of saturation. This is now starting to make lipid mixtures to mimic bacterial membranes. So in this case, it was looked at a mixture of uh, PG with a cardiolipin in a six to four ratio to mimic a gram positive bacterial membrane and PG with PE in a three, three to seven ratio to mimic gram negative bacterial membranes. Of course, these are only approximations. The real, uh, the real bacterial membranes contains more components like polysaccharides, but this is a basic model of two different types of bacterial membranes uh, as a step forward to the to the to the real systems. And here um, the comparison of the two systems in the top right shows that um, the if you look in the top in the right panel for the for the the model gram negative membrane the, the two data sets in detour with the, the critical edge, the, uh, which have the blue squares, um, they're almost the same. Whereas in the left panel with the PG, they're much different. And it showed that with the, the PG and their, uh, sorry, the, the cardiolipin, with the cardiolipin, so the gram positive bacterial membranes, there was a greater extent of peptide penetration. So this work at least provided a, a, an indication of the possible greater efficacy of this peptide to bind to gram positive bacterial membrane. Okay, so we go on to the second study now, which is uh, binding of liquid crystalline nanocarriers. Um, I can't remember whether I stole this from one of Tommy's papers as well, but I may well have done. <laughs> anyway, um, essentially uh, lipids will self-assemble assemble into different structures according to the, the type of lipid, the, the temperature, and various other parameters. Um, and, and then when you add components to lipid, this can obviously change the phase of the, the structures that, in which they self-assemble too. So there's different structures that can form. I mean, lipids can self-assemble into micelles, hexagonal, lamella phase, cubic phase, reverse hexagonal, reverse micelle. So there's, there's various types of uh, structures that, that uh, small molecules, amphibolic molecules can self-assemble into. Um, this project was rather interesting because it was motivated by some data by uh, Marite Cardenas, who was looking at mixtures of dendromers with lipids. So dendromers, as I mentioned, are hyperbranched polyelectrolytes. And she was looking at their, their mixtures with, um, with POPC, POPG uh, lipid vesicles. So what was, what was known is that when you add the dendromers, they self-assemble into these lamella multilayer st stacks. And what she found, in fact, was that when she did different experiments on these systems, she ended up with different results. So obviously that's not ideal. Um, she would do a technique like ellipsometry or a technique like the quartz crystal microbalance, and these results just couldn't be uh, understood together. And furthermore, when she did neutrons, when she did it at the ISIS neutron source in the UK or the ILL in France, she also got different results. So, this wasn't, this wasn't ideal. And then she, she actually saw a talk I gave on, on a polymer surfactant system where I was talking about effects of gravity on the interactions of, of, of liquid crystalline nanoparticles with, with surfaces. And here, the fact that the, these particles eventually can um, either cream to the top of the sample if they're lighter than the water, or they can sink to the bottom of the sample if they're heavier. So, that, that picture of the flask there in the center is uh, a picture of one of these samples after some period of time, after some hours. And what was interesting is that Marité was looking at very small samples before. I mean, she was mixing one or two milliliters or less, and you know, some creamy liquid would form, injected into the measuring cell. And it, it, I guess there just wasn't that perspective that gravity could have, a, have an effect on the sample. So we designed this experiment on Figaro where on the right, you can see there are two silicon crystals sandwiched between 
uh, a bit of Teflon, which has which actually has the sample, the liquid sample in. So we could inject the liquid sample between two silicon crystals. And as I mentioned, the, the neutrons travel transmit very well through the silicon. So we could reflect them down through the top crystal and reflect up off the liquid, but we could also reflect up through the first crystal and down off the liquid. So we could actually do solid liquid measurements at, at an upper and a lower interface on the same cell. And the question then is, you know, immediately from when you inject a sample into in, and, and make it interact with a solid interface, would you actually get different results? So the, the main data figure there shows with time the, the data that uh, we got um, at the two surfaces. So the initial data, uh, which is lightest and not that dissimilar, but you can see already that that lightest green data at the top where the, where the black arrow starts going up, there is quite a fringe there at low Q, whereas in the lightest data in the bottom, the light blue, uh, there isn't. So already from the very start, from injecting this, um, this mixture of dendrimers and lipids into a sample, different structures were forming on the top and the bottom interface. And then with time, I mean, look how the, look how the data changed. The bottom interface made this very sharp interference fringe at low Q. And the top interface have these four, brag, uh, sorry, three brag peaks showing that the, the lamella particle falls are actually down to the interface. So these were modeled through uh, as, the, as a result of the talents of a, a very skilled uh, data, uh, neutron expert called Eric Watkins. And essentially the schematics on the right show how these samples are evolving. At the, at the bottom interface, there's a, there's a lipid bilayer, but it interlaces dendrimers that are sitting on the surface or sitting above the bilayer. But with time, all the dendrimers penetrate through the, through the bilayer and the dendrimers sit on the surface and the lipid bilayer sits on top. Whereas on the top surface, that's the starting point, And with time, the lamella particles attach. So I think this, and I must admit, I remember one of Marite's reactions when, when she saw that big 100 milliliter sample. It's like, wow, how, how, could, how could we ever imagine that was happening you know, on, when, when you have less than a milliliter of sample? But actually just seeing what happens with the effects of gravity suddenly made it all make sense. I know Tommy has a, an ellipsometer where the sample is vertical and the, the laser beam is, is horizontal. Um, so, and then a QCMD, probably the, the I think the, the sample would always be horizontal. And then for doing a measurement on the, the D17 neutron reflectometer ILL, the sample's vertical. Figure it could be horizontal, but it could be either above or below the sample. But it just shows that these, this fact is important. It's really important because if you have phase separation in the liquid and you have particles going up or down with time, you're going to get different interactions at the surface according to where the surface is. And this can really help to explain some unreproducibility in results. But it also shows that you need very careful experimental design. After this technical you know, discovery, uh, we then went to look at, look at the interaction of, of, uh, of this, these mixtures with preformed bilayers of different charge. And actually what we showed there is that the, the particles would attach if the bilayer had uh, sufficient negative charge, but not under. So this actually was quite interesting in the sense that we could actually tune the particle interaction with the, with, with the preformed bilayer according to the orientation of the sample, but also its charge. So I think in there, there's an overarching lesson about experimental design. Okay then, so uh, the last study I'm going to introduce is the interaction of cancer, anti-cancer drugs. And here anthracycline antibiotics include doxorubicin, which is a very well used uh, drug in chemotherapy uh, all over the world, and idorubicin. And they're structurally similar anti-cancer drugs as can be seen at the bottom right. So you have the four rings, uh, sorry, the five, four rings joined together and then another ring joined by an ether oxygen. But there are different chemical groups in two different places on the molecules. So um, the mode of interaction is known. So we weren't uh, necessarily looking to get insight into the mode of interaction because that's with intercalation to DNA. But 
in any case, the outer cell membrane is the first barrier to be crossed. So uh, this, this, this uh, project was to look at the interaction of different anti-cancer drugs with different lipid monomers. And as I mentioned, this was performed in collaboration with uh, Renata Bilovic and Dorota Matijusha at the University of Warsaw. Okay, so, well, now we have our, our usual question of how to design our model system. And this is rather crude, a bit simple to start with, but like I say, it's the start of a project. But here we chose DMPC as, uh, as uh, an example of a healthy cell membrane, because we know that healthy cell membranes have more ionic PC lipids. And we chose DMPS as an analogous uh, lipid to, to mimic um, cancer cell membranes. And like I say, it's a very crude way to, to, um, to, to, to model healthy and cancer cell membranes because there are many other things that change, like the amount of cholesterol, for example. But this is just one way we did it. So we've got the, the zwitterionic or neutral PC lipids and the negatively charged PS lipids. Excuse me. Yeah. Hey, Richard, could I just uh, ask you a quick question? Uh, yeah. Why are these instruments made so big? Like, it feels like we studied these very tiny, small molecules, you know, and the instrument like feels like so huge. Why are they not made a slightly smaller? Yeah, you mean like this one, this Langmuir-Trop, or do you mean Figaro? Yes. The no. Langmuir-Trop? Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's a good example. So th this actually, this is maybe not the best picture of a Langmuir-Trop for an air water interface, because you can see in the middle of that Langmuir-Trop there's a hole. So this Langmuir-Trop is actually designed for transferring lipid monolayers. Um, so you have a solid, and that solid, like, uh, you, it goes down into the water as you push the, li the, the, the lipids onto it, or up, I can't remember. But essentially, there's a transfer of lipids onto the solid. So you actually need quite a big surface because you have this large solid going up and down. And that's the trough they had in Warsaw, and that's the one they used. But you do get much smaller troughs these days. You can have troughs like this big. Um, you need room for a surface pressure monitor. If I'm going to use ellipsometry or Bruce Schrangham microscopy, I've got to have room for a beam, a laser beam to come in and reflect off the middle. So in, in any case, I would need it around that size. But it's true, this one is quite big, but I think it's also used for transferring to solids. Okay, thank you. So they, they are available like a much smaller yeah. also yeah. like, okay, so yeah. thank you. <laughs> great, good question, by the way. Um, great. Okay, so uh, so D DMPC and DMPS lipid monolayers were formed, and then doxorubicin or edosorubicin was injected into the subface. So the data I'll show you are all on the doxorubicin, and this was the initial surface pressure data to show that on the left with the PC, the effects of the Okay, this has the interruptions as well, sorry. Uh, the effects of the two anthracyclines are relatively small compared with the effects on the DMPS. So if you look on the right on the DMPS, those effects of the lipids uh, of, the, of the drugs are, are much bigger and they're also very different. So the idea of saying, well, yeah, that's really interesting, but we can't tell from, the, from these data alone what's happening. So maybe we can get some information out of neutrons. So this was the low-Q analysis applied to the interaction of doxorubicin with the DMPC or DMPS monolayers. And um, we, could, we could guess from the surface pressure data that there would be a lower interaction. But we don't really know um, because we don't know the mode of binding of the drug to the lipid. But here we, we've pro proved it. So at the top right, you can see the, the, the surface excess of the, of the lipid um, and of the, of the drug as a, as a function of the surface pressure. And the amount of drug is effectively, it's around, it's around the, the sensitivity limit, it's really, really low. But for the DMPS, the amount of drugs much, much higher and even, even higher than the amount of lipid. Um, so there's a strong drug binding and it's not just electrostatically driven because there's additional um, drug over the, over the amount of lipid. Then, um, then we recorded some data. This is just uh, one set of data repeated three times. So actually the data is the same in all of those uh, um, figures. But what, what's different is the models applied. So you might say there's not a huge difference even in the models, but you can see some difference. So on the left, um, at the high Q, 
there's there's one data set, the green that turns up at the end, and the, another data set, the red that's lower than the, the models lower than the points. So it's showing that this model of the drug sitting only in the change layer is not very good. And then on the right one of the drug sitting under the head groups, um, both of the models in the D2O, that's the red and the green, they kind of sit together, but the data are clearly separated. And so actually, when you optimize the model, which was the central one, um, the DMPS was sitting exclusively in the head group layer. And that, that's the best model we can get. So in this case, compared with some of the data I showed you previously, maybe it could be underwhelming because these, these differences in the models are not that big because we're really looking at thin films. But uh, it's enough to say that there's evidence that the drug sitting in the head group layer and then for DMPC, this is actually the data with and without the drug, and they're almost in, almost interchangeable. We're really at the, the sensitivity limit. Um, in one contrast, there's a small difference. In the other three, there's not a fitable difference. So, um, so the the conclusion is that the, the the interaction with the DMPS is much much higher. We've quantified that for the first time. There's a reduction in the lipid surface excess as well. Um, so the drug is also solubilizing some of the lipid and uh, and there's in, in cases, yeah, there's actually it exceeds equimolar uh, replacement by the drug um, and the binding with the DMPC is minimal. Okay, so I, I should be wrapping up soon because we've only got 10 minutes left. So this is just the last summary slide to say that we started this, uh, this, this tutorial really by looking at uh, three different ways we can use the same technique in terms of the interfacial structure, the interfacial composition and particle attachment using neutrons. So then we looked at three different projects, the structural disruption by antimicrobial peptides. And really this, this, is, this is an example of taking a system and building up its complexity, looking at effects of lipid charge, saturation, surface pressure, and then going on to more realistic model systems. Then we looked at membrane binding of liquid crystal nanocarriers and uh, electrostatics, you, you, would just, you would imagine are important, they were shown to be important, but the effects of gravity were way beyond what we ever thought. They really, in, in, in taking, a, uh, in taking a, a mixture of lipid nanoparticles um, and, in, and interacting them with the surface, the interactions with the surface above and below the sample were, were different right from the start. So it really shows that in terms of experimental design, if you have any sample with phase separation, you really need to consider effects of gravity. And last, the, the interactions of the anti-cancer drugs that uh, some initial studies have been conducted on interactions of doxorubicine and model membranes. And we haven't gained in, insight into the way the drug works, but we've gained insight into its mode of interaction with lipid, lipid membranes. And we've managed to quantify for the first time this extent of interactions. So that concludes my talk. I hope you've found it interesting enough and uh, very happy to answer any questions. <laughs>